Hey everyone, today we're going to continue our focus on elements of stories and specifically we are going to continue that focus in regards to the fiction genre. So again, let's just do a quick reminder. We read genres in this class. We talked about that. They're categories. Fiction genre, authors make decisions, and of course, we understand they make decisions about what subgenre this might be. They make decisions about the elements of a story, characters' names, setting, if the mood is going to contribute to setting, and all those wonderful things that we've already talked about. So again, we are going to be focusing specifically on the fiction genre when we talk about elements of a story and continue to analyze elements of a story this week. Now, don't forget, we also have the nonfiction genre, which has to do with real-life events and topics. And again, you might see that these elements of a story are in nonfiction. We're going to read that later, but it doesn't mean that it's the same thing as fiction. It just means that it's a story. It's still a story, but a fiction story is made up and a nonfiction story is real. And then, But on the other hand, you also might have nonfiction that looks different, totally different from a story. And again, authors make decisions about nonfiction. Later on, we'll also look at the drama genre, which we've talked about very, very briefly, and our poetry genre, which again, we've talked about very, very briefly. Both of those genres will be covered later. I'm sorry, all three of those genres will be covered later in this quarter, and some of them even in second marking period. So again, let's please focus on our fiction genre, the fact that authors make decisions, and the elements of a story, and how we go about analyzing them. So no matter what I read, I will think like the author poet. Again, this is something that we've already done. I apologize if the top is cut off there. But why? But why? But why? I'm going to go through this whole slide again and bring up all the but why, it's just like we did in class last week. Um, you have to be able to think like the author or poet, and the only way to truly do that is after reading something say, but why? But, but why? Why would the author choose that? Why would the author make that decision? Why did the author name that character Bob? Why did the author describe the setting like that? Why did he choose to tell the plot, to organize the plot in that order? But why? But why, 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 why? Ask yourself why, think like the author and your, or the poet, and you're going to do fine. So important things to remember, what I need is in what I read. Authors make decisions. Think like the author, okay? And finally, stop overthinking. Now again, what I need is in what I read. We're not looking to the sky for the answers to the questions we're asked. We're gonna understand that authors make decisions. So when we're asked a question about something an author wrote, we need to find the answer in the text. Authors make decisions. Okay, just like I just said, since they made decisions, what I need is in what I read. They go hands in hand. Think like the author by asking about why, and please stop overthinking. These things are so important. The answers are there. Excuse me, I have the hiccups. Just take the time to look at what you read and find those answers and to think like the author. So, um, again, what I need is in what I read, a very quick review on inferences and conclusions. What I need is in what I read, add a splash of prior knowledge plus a dash of common sense, and you're going to have an inference or a conclusion. So the text says, plus what I know and prior knowledge will lead me to an inference or a conclusion because inferences and conclusions are based on the facts, and you you. Um, analyze those facts based on what you know about them based on your own experiences and common sense. A generalization, of course, is a little bit different. It's a type of conclusion that's based on limited information. Try to avoid that. So that actually brings us to the actual elements of a story. So that's it for our review. So there are actual elements of stories, we've talked about them, and they're called point of view, setting, characterization, plot, theme, tone, style, mood, right? We've all looked at these already. In fact, we looked at them specifically in the Scarlet Ibis. We know the point of view. The brother, the older brother told that story as an adult, looking back and remembering the story. It was a flashback. We understand that the setting changed a few times throughout the Scarlet Ibis, remember? It was uh, Old Lady Swamp or Old Woman Swamp, I don't remember. The house, okay, so it changed. Characterization, we learned a lot about Doodle and the Brother. Plot, this was actually told in kind of a fancy 
format where, again, the author was looking back at something that happened and telling the story. It was a flashback. We have theme, which we learned from the Scarlet Ibis as well, and tone, style, mood. And we saw that a lot of times in the Scarlet Ibis, the, the um, mood was created with the setting. So the description of the setting helped to put us in some type of a mood. So note to self, authors make decisions. What? What? Note to self, for the last time, authors make decisions. So again, when we think on focusing on fiction and other narratives and the elements, again, think about what we did with the Scarlet Ibis, okay? We went through character. We went through setting and mood. We went through point of view. We went through theme. And we also went through style. We also went through plot, flashbacks, foreshadowing, straight chronological. We've already talked about all these things and we've practiced them with the Scarlet Ibis. So there are specific elements that are present in every fictional short, in every fictional story, and here they are. Now finally, we have a purpose. So even though every story has to contain the things that are listed here, the final thing that an author needs to do is decide what their purpose is. So that's going to bring us to actual, to discussion about our first, um, our, our first elements. So first we're gonna talk about point of view and setting. And again, don't know why this is cut off at the top, but it is cut off. So on the left-hand side, we have point of view and setting and uh, explanations, definitions. And on the right side, we have examples. So point of view is the way something is seen and told. A narrator is the person telling the story. So per first person point of view is the narrator tells the story and is in it. We've talked about that. Second person point of view, you won't see too much. It's the narrator speaking to the reader. All right, and they will use uh, you all the time, you, you, you. Third person point of view is the narrator tells the story and is not in the story at all. We call them an eye in the sky. So third person point of view is a narrator who's looking down. The author created this eye in the sky, right? He decided that my character isn't in this, um, my narrator isn't in the story. Um, the narrator is going to tell the story as if they're watching it on TV, right? And that's a third person point of view. Now that narrator can know everything, like what the characters are thinking and what they're feeling, or they can be limited and they can only report what they see. Again, the author makes that decision. So let's look at an example. The monkey's paw. At the third glass, his eyes got brighter and he began to talk. The little family circling regard circle regarding with eager interest the visitor from distant parts as he squared his broad shoulders in the chair and spoke of strange scenes and dowdy deeds of wars and plagues and strange people so this is an eye in the sky this person isn't in the story but he's looking down or watching it almost like it's in a movie at the third glass his eyes got brighter so his eyes and he began to talk the little family circle regarding with eager interest this is someone on the outside looking in and telling you the story Okay, and it is limited because he does not know. This narrator doesn't know what the um, other characters are thinking and feeling. Then we have setting, of course, and the setting, we've talked about this in Activity C. Some of you had trouble with that from the Scarlet Ibis Activity C. There's a lot to a setting. It, it is the time, the place that can change the story. We can start one place and end another place. Um, it is the atmosphere. It's the... Um, are there leaves on the trees or not? Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it summer? Is it foggy? Is it fall? It, well, everything contributes to setting. And most importantly, what, what's going on behind the scenes is also very important. So the historical events going on are also very important. So um, our stick author, if you remember, was influenced by this Ebola outbreak. That was a world event that was happening, and that influenced him and, and, and actually contributed to the setting. Um, but there are some authors that will actually write during a specific time, like World War II, okay? And again, that becomes part of the setting, okay? So again, in the monkey's paw, the night was cold and wet, but in the small parlor of Lake and Villa, the blinds were drawn and the fire burned brightly. So that is a little touch of a setting. All right. Next, we have characterization. You can understand stories better when you understand characters. And when you understand characters, you look closely at the following items. First of all, character traits. Second, motivation. What makes this character act the way they do? Third is conflict. What are they facing? Fourth is point of view. Fifth is relationships to other people in the story. Sixth is actions. And, and seven is dialogue. Look at all of those things 
and infer. Use common sense. Explain to yourself why a character might act the way that they do, and then and then try and think like the author. Why would he want his character to act this way? Okay, so treat characters like real people and try and figure them out, just like you try and figure everybody out that you meet. But good luck figuring me out. Because that ain't going to happen very easily. <laughs> All right. Next we have our plot. And our plot looks like a pyramid. Okay, and the reason it's outlined like this is because it actually goes in that order. Unless you have a flashback. Then it takes a little bit of a detour somewhere. So at the beginning of a plot pyramid, the plot is the story. This, then that. The thing you tell your friends after you see a movie. This happened, then that happened, then this, then that, then this, then that. That's the plot. Okay, so the pyramid right here walks us through the seven parts of a story. So when you retell a story to somebody and you give only the important parts, you're giving them the plot, you're beginning with the exposition, which is the beginning. There's an inciting moment that causes all of this action. Then you have all this rising action. Then you have this climax when the main character actually faces their conflict and changes somehow because of it. And then you have the falling action, the denouement and resolution. Okay, so that's your plot. Next, we have theme. And again, this is the lesson learned or underlying meaning of a literary, literary work, and it may be stated or implied. Again, theme is intentional. The author made a decision. So let's take a look. After reading something, you can say to yourself, um, I realized something about life, or um, I, I, realize, I recognize something that was described to me as being familiar. There are a few questions you can ask yourself to get to the theme. Did I feel something about this character? That's a big question. But did I believe something that I didn't believe before by the time I was done reading this? Do I agree with something that I disagreed with before? Or did I realize that I was able to do something that I couldn't do before? So it's those things after you read that you realize about life or possibly about yourself. So after reading The Scarlet Ibis, I realized that we should probably be nicer to the people that we love. Or sometimes people are cruel to the people that they love. That's what we realized. So, mood. Happy, sad, confused, don't care. That's a mood. Mood is the feeling you get from the author's words, phrases, or phrase choices, okay? This is very simple. You know this. You can use the same word, phrase, clues to help you determine a mood. Depressed, happy, sad, angry, scared. All those things create a mood, and they're purposely chosen by the author. So words like excited, playful, energetic, those are all yay mood. Words like grief, black crying, somber, quiet sobs, that creates a very dark mood. Okay, so you always want to look at the way that a setting is described. That helps to create a mood. You look at the way the people are described. That also helps to create a mood. But the words help you. Pay attention to the words. So that brings us to our pre-quiz. Show what you know, everybody. All right, right now you're going to go into the course, and you're going to complete your pre-quiz elements of a story, and I will see you in class.